So it is um, a great pleasure to welcome everybody today to the Marguerite Hertz Memorial Lecture. Uh, Dr. Hertz was a faithful uh, member of our, of our society uh, who contributed a great deal to personality assessment and whose legacy was to create a lecture uh, in her honor that would um, honor the memory of people who have passed away, who have made significant contributions to the field of personality assessment. And tonight, uh, we are, as a society, going to honor the memory and the legacy of Dr. Theodore Milan. Uh, there are a number of panel members who uh, know Ted very well. Uh, I have to say that this is a, a great personal um, honor for me to be part of this because, uh, as we were just talking about, uh, I was a graduate student uh, when Ted came to the University of Miami after leaving uh, the University of Illinois, um, and I was in the second class that he taught at the University of Miami. So the first thing that I think of uh, when I think of Ted is the voice. If any of you have met him, he had a, a voice and a command of language uh, that um, left you sometimes breathless or searching for a dictionary uh, because of the words that he used. So, um, so Ted had a great influence on me as I started my professional education and on my career. So it's uh, a personal pleasure and honor to be able to introduce the members of the panel tonight. And so we're going to, for the sake of time, present plaques to all the uh, uh, panel members tonight uh, be before they speak so, there's n so they're not rushed at the end of the time tonight. So first, uh, the first plaque is for Dr. Stephen Strack. It's, it's really a pleasure to uh, have Steve up here on the podium with me. Steve and I were a year apart in graduate school and we published a paper together when we were in graduate school, so it's really uh, a pleasure to be able to uh, introduce him tonight. The second um, honoree, or the second person honoring Ted is Dr. James Choka. Next is um, Dr. Theo Jalowski, did I say that right? Yeah, okay. Uh, who is a um, colleague and friend of Ted's uh, at Pearson, so come on up. Dr. Seth Grossman is the next person, uh, panel member, who is here tonight. Uh, Dr. Grossman worked very closely uh, with Ted and continuation of the MCMI and is here at the convention. Many of you attended the workshop he taught, uh, rolling out the latest version of the MCMI. It's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Grossman. And the last plaque uh, is for uh, Rene Milan, who we had hoped would be with us today, but who is unfortunately not able to make uh, the visit and to attend this um, session. Uh, taking the, cla the plaque for um, Mrs. Milan is her son, Andy. I'm just going to say a few words. Um, some friends of mine in uh, Germany told me that a rumor circulated around Europe last year that the famous dog psychologist uh, Caesar of Milan had died. I wonder how that rumor got started. We are here today to honor my father, the famous human psychologist Theodore Milan. Uh, many people create things. Uh, some people create 
worlds with the things that they make. Uh, my father and mother certainly created my world and the world of our family, as well as a world of ideas. Um, my mother doesn't travel easily in, in winter, who does? Uh, but asked me to acknowledge all of you and the colleagues uh, that my father loved as friends. Uh, your wishes and thoughts have made a tough year just a little easier. Um, now, many of you have spoken over the years about what my father has done for you, and we wanted to acknowledge all you have done for him, and therefore uh, for our family. And importantly, all you do for the people in the world who have few places to turn for self-understanding and healing. Thank you, and special thanks to Steve Strack for all you do and for arranging this event. Thank you. And with no further ado, I'm going to turn this over now to Steve Strack, who is going to uh, MC the uh, panel. I uh, want to extend a, a great deal of gratitude to, uh, to Steve for his efforts in organizing this and bringing together uh, people that knew Ted well and who are going to bring his memory uh, alive to us tonight. Steve? Thanks very much. I definitely uh, thank the SPA board for uh, making it possible to have this honor here in Brooklyn. Some of you may know that uh, Ted Milan was born and raised right here. Uh, these were his old stomping grounds, and uh, he used to love sharing stories about his early days here. And so it was not a surprise after many, many years in Miami that he decided to spend the last years of his life here in New York, not far from here, just across the Hudson in Port Jervis, where his daughter Diana had a home. So um, it's, it's a wonderful tribute at this point in time for all of us. Um, I see in the audience, in addition to Andy, that there's quite a few of Dr. Milan's progeny, children and grandchildren. Could do you just wave so we can see you? I see, uh, yeah. I'm sorry that uh, I'm sorry that uh, your mom uh, could not be here and Diane could not be here, but they're with us in spirit, so we want to share that with them. I'm sure you'll agree that it's a daunting task to um, bring out the special memory of any individual in the course of an hour, and this is all the more true for somebody like Ted Milan, who is one of the uh, greatest uh, psychologists of his generation. And uh, it's something like trying to explain to somebody how big the giant redwood trees are in California or why it's called the Grand Canyon. Um, Ted's career spanned six decades. Uh, he authored and co-authored dozens of books, test manuals, uh, 150 chapters, articles, commentaries. Uh, he had a personality theory that some of you may know about that uh, he began in the 60s and was still revising at the time of his death. And his international came for that. His taxonomy of personality disorders uh, became a big part of DSM-3. And for those of you who are interested in studying personality, which I think is most all of us, uh, it's, it was a wonderful coincidence, shall we say, that Ted's model was linked up with the DSM and has continued to this day to be a part of that. Uh, his eight assessment measures expanded the, um, uh, the reach of our personality tests. I mean, back in the 80s, who heard of behavioral medicine? Who thought about doing tests for ch uh, children, pre-adolescents, adolescents. Ted had a vision uh, in the early days to really bring assessment to all of the areas where we work, and um, that was one of his greatest accomplishments. Um, I don't have time to go into much more of this, but fortunately, SPA has granted me an opportunity to put together a special series of articles on Ted's work, and I think uh, that should be coming out later this year and we'll cover a lot of the things that uh, we think are his greatest accomplishments and which will also define his legacy for the future. What I'd like to do today, though, is to hand the uh, podium over to some people who can evoke the person. You know, all of us who knew Ted, uh, his work, you know, you know about his commanding personality and things like that and the scholarly nature of what he did, but what about the person? Who was he? What was he like? Uh, the gentlemen that are here with me are going to uh, tell you about Ted from their knowledge and their experiences with him in a variety of capacities as students, um, colleagues, uh, co-authors, um, 
uh, business associates, uh, even extended family and friends. And so uh, I think that's what our goal is here today, is to give you a little bit of a flavor for what uh, Ted was like as a person. Um, I think most of you know Seth Grossman, who uh, has worked with Ted for many years as a co-author, is also working on the MCMI4. When he's not doing Milan things, he's uh, a, uh, he heads a practice in near Fort Lauderdale called Psych Fitness, right? And he's also at the uh, Florida International University School of Medicine. Uh, Jim Toka is also well known to, to most people here. He's a prolific MCMI author and um, personality assessment researcher. And um, he knew Ted before his MCMI days. This was back at the university, when he was at the University of Illinois at Chicago, right? In the 70s, so that's pretty special. And I think we also mentioned Dr. Theo, Theo Jalowski, who's here, has a very um, special pedigree as a uh, marketing um, uh, expert, and uh, first met Ted in the 80s when he was hired by NCS to help launch the initial um, Milan test, which were the MCMI, the MBHI, and the MAPI. So we'll have a variety of um, perspectives, and I think uh, this is something that'll uh, hopefully convey something about who Ted was as a person. For myself, I was a student of Ted's, as Ron Ganellan said, and for my contribution, I put together a slideshow, uh, which I thank the Milan family for providing the slides for the most part, and that will all show at the end, and that'll uh, give you a perspective of Ted from when he was the largest two-year-old in Brooklyn to, um, we keep talking about him, but if you never met Ted, he was 6'4", and he used to wear his curly hair up so it was about 6'6 six, six at the top. And so he was very commanding uh, as far as that goes. But in any event, the, the most recent slides are from his recent years in professional uh, uh, meetings, some which right here, so I think you'll recognize yourself in some of the photos. So. Uh, let me just turn the podium over now to uh, Dr. Seth Grossman. Thank you, Steve, and good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us in this tribute. Many of us in this audience who have interacted with Ted Milan as a peer, a colleague, a mentee, a family member, or even some combination of those, know very well that in addition to his erudite and charismatic and huge-hearted presence as a leader in our field, as the patriarch of his family, Ted was also quite an amazing storyteller. So this evening, Steve, Jim, Theo, and I will try to do justice to some of the stories coming from our experiences with him. So to my experience with Ted, I have something of an unusual history. I'm one of two students that I'm aware of whose parent was also a student of Ted's. In turn, our families then also share a friendship that dates back quite a ways. And for me, that creates another unusual phenomenon. I was among the last round of Ted's students in his university days, and as a returning student, a bit older than most going through their doctoral experience at that time. Yet his influence on my career actually began just a few short years after the publication of Modern Psychopathology. This would have put me at about the age of five. A short time before this, Ted and his family had moved away from my hometown in Pennsylvania to Chicago. This early influential event happened in one of several scattered memories I have of Ted visiting his old stomping grounds, making a stop by my childhood home to say hello to my family, and this particular memory went something like this. Being about five, I was enjoying some early attempts at mastery of rudimentary five-year-old skills. The one I was particularly fond of at the time was this intricacies of this game called checkers. Upon Ted's arrival, I was more than a little excited to show my parents' friend what I had recently learned. I have a vivid mem memory of uh, Ted's mouth just curling up into his signature smile, very, very subtle, his not so subtle knowing look coming from behind the glasses, and his response to me. You should learn how to play chess. He then began to show me, making makeshift rooks and bishops and knights and so forth out of different checker pieces. And little did I know that that day, I just had my first of many lessons from Ted related to managing complexities through the use of very simple tools. Fast forward to somewhere in the ballpark of 20 years later. I had had an undergrad career in the performing arts and as a slightly later realization that that lifestyle just wasn't a good fit for me, 
I found myself pondering what my innate skill and interest set might be, which led me to pursue a master's in counseling psychology. After a couple of very part-time semesters, still not very sure of the direction beyond a vague sense that something about this new endeavor did feel right, I got a note from Ted asking if, he'd be, if I'd be interested in coming to APA here in New York that summer and to attend his work on the evolutionary theory. At the time, that was a very new thing. It was one of the first times he had actually rolled that out. So off to APA in New York I went, not really knowing what I was going to expect, but really coming up on yet another huge game changer in my career and in my life. So until that day, I tried to make sense of the different traditional personality theories as they were taught through my program. And I toyed, as many early psych students do, with adopting one or another as, in quotes, my home orientation. And I think not unlike many who have been there, I had something of the Goldilocks experience. Some theories were too big, some too small, and others seemed just right, at least until the big scary statistics pair came by and mumbled something about evidence base. But in my mind, they all seemed to be saying something important, but lacking other things that were important. And different combinations of these seemed to tell a little bit of a better tale and a little bit more evidence-based story than what, about what really makes people tick. But something was still missing. So I sat there in that workshop, and my table mate asked me about what I did, where I worked, and a series of actually very simple questions that at that point in my career were completely over my head. I was a beginning master's student. I was working in a therapeutic school. I had an undergrad in drama, and not much more experience in psych than that. And he was a psychologist with many decades of experience. He drew me this little diagram to show me how to design a t-test to myself to see if the program I was working for was effective. And I thought to myself, what's a t-test? I didn't share that with him. That's when Ted came to the front of the room and warned us that we have a hell of a lot to get through, let's get started. And I thought to myself, well, what's more, one more theory I could partially understand. Oh boy, was I wrong about that. Within a few minutes, I was absolutely captivated. I had unknowingly stumbled into lesson number two in how to manage complex phenomena through a very simple lens. Indeed, if you looked at all living phenomena through three basic evolutionary principles, you got to see how predators and prey in big ecosystems, such as a rainforest, how they interacted. You got to see how microsystems, such as smashed atoms, rebalanced and stabilized. And of the most interest to me and to the people in the room, you got a very simple yet comprehensive view of basic human motivation. Looking a little down, further down the road of this theory, that Ted described the connection between all these disparate theories I partially understood, and I suddenly knew why I only partially understood them. Behavior, self-perception, unconscious, cognitions, the biophysical, all of these, these were partial explanations. That much I already understood. That day, I learned how they all worked in concert with one another to articulate nuances of a personality that just was not possible with any of these parts alone or in simple combinations. So speaking to Ted during one of the breaks that day, I must have said something that indicated to him that my lights indeed were on and I was attuned to what he was talking about. Because his next words of advice went something like, move to Miami, study towards your doctorate down there and work with me. Wow. Um, Ted didn't beat around the bush. Uh, I think in general, when someone suggests a tectonic shift in your life like that, you pause for a bit and see where it falls into place with your big picture. But somehow, though, this notion made as much sense to me as everything else that began to unfold that day. To be fair, it was a little while so I could wrap up a life in the Northeast, but I did. Thank you for the musical accompaniment, by the way. I could probably spend our entire hour today telling stories of my experience as a student in of Ted's in Miami, but of course I won't do that. Instead, I'm going to switch to a more impressionistic view, give a little taste of how these pre-student experiences I've described oriented me towards what came next. By this time, when I was starting my doctoral studies, virtually all of Ted's professional activities were taking place at his home. And for those of you who have never, had never visited his home in Miami, if you've ever looked at a schematic of structures within the nucleus of a single neuron, uh, you might have a bit of an idea as to the feel of this environment. Virtually everywhere you turned, there was something to ponder. From huge iron abstract sculptures placed around the lawn, to a coffee mug with a cartoon caption saying, just call me Mr. Personality, to the books. Not just psychology books. Books on art, 
cosmogony, physics, art, chemistry, art, <laughs> biology, art, philosophy, religion, sociology. Did I mention art? Everywhere. From there to the vast collection of art on the wall, some of which was Ted's original work, to the... Is that a bust of his head? It was. To the music playing throughout the home and a study down by the pool, which was most frequently Bach. You literally could not visit here and not gain a few IQ points. And those daily activities in what we call the Institute could consist of producing copious volumes of writing in psychology one day, scanning and enhancing drawings of notable masters of the mind on another, and on other days, long talks with Ted about anything from the limits of radical behaviorism to the contributions of one Romantic era composer over another, to who had the best chance of creating an upset in that year's Super Bowl, or to how life was treating you as at the given time. No doubt the life of any grad student in psych had its challenges, and that of a returning grad student with slightly more outside responsibilities with no exception. So beyond the role of professional mentor, I think I can speak to the experience of all of us lucky enough to have held that similar position, whether that was an official assistantship or directly through the institute. I can say that Ted would invariably take on something of the role of another father figure, helping us mold and shape not only our careers, but also significant aspects of the future outlook of our lives. So you might imagine working there that there might be some pressure to think like Ted. Not so. One of the hallmarks of this working environment was the freedom to really discover your own style. The resources were all there, as was the guidance, if you asked for it. Ultimately, Ted wielded the editor's pen for any work going out the door, but how you formulated your ideas and ultimately your work was up to you, without pressure and without judgment. I believe that this is the reason why, if you look at our cadre, you see the numerous psychologists who emerged from this environment, all with vastly different styles, but a sense of a common language among us. <coughs> and to my experience, I can recall one instance of disagreement, however. This is a matter related to my dissertation that would eventually contribute the subscales to the MCMI. As a variation on a theme put in some general terms, Ted had it in mind that I choose a rather simple path of least resistance to getting the dissertation and subsequently those subscales completed. And I had come up with something a little more complicated, tying the subscales back to the theory. So how about this? That man who initially taught me chess all those many years ago was suggesting that this time I play checkers. No, it was not going to happen. I was going to play chess, and I felt I had the roadmap to do so. Ted's response was more or less, OK, I'll be over here if you need me for anything. No doubt I took him up on that offer a few times. But at the end of the day, I was able to call checkmate on that dissertation. So I didn't really see it at the time, but I soon came to think that this was what Ted had actually wanted me to do. Looking back on many of our interactions as a reflection of my ways of being in the past, I think Ted spotted a tendency in me to be too agreeable to too many things, probably out of an earlier lack of confidence. I also don't believe he would have tolerated my pouring heart and soul into a dissertation problem he knew couldn't be resolved. It became apparent then that I was managing complexity beyond what I thought I could do and doing it by using a simple explanatory system that he knew by then that I understood. And that finally led to a trust that carried forward into later years as I became a licensed psychologist and I began representing Ted's work in professional circles. So on a final note, I want to say a couple words about the idea of family and some different levels of what that means in context of talking about Ted. I'm thinking of the many people who have shared time and interacted considerably with Ted and his family. Each has his or her own value, his or her own uniqueness, his or her own contribution. And each has become a member of something very special, a family in its own right. The four of us speaking today did not work together extensively, but we share a common bond and an undeniable influence. And we are but four of many. And on a similar note, I would be entirely remiss not to acknowledge something else that's pretty incredible. And that is this professional's family inclusion among Ted's personal family, several of whom are here at this gathering. They've invariably opened their doors to us, sharing their dear patriarch and their own friendship with us. 
And again, I'm going to take the liberty of speaking for the professional family to just say thanks. Ted's been a gift to us all. And we will do all we can in our professional and personal pursuits to perpetually honor that gift. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about something different from what Seth was uh, sharing with us. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, starting with my own training. Um, my first um, training site was at the uh, North Chicago VA Hospital around 1969. Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, the uh, ward I was assigned to was uh, uh, a ward that treated uh, mostly, uh, well, at that time they were thought to be schizophrenics. And uh, now, I, thinking back, I think that uh, there were many people with an organic brain lesion then there, but uh, uh, nevertheless, um, uh, it was uh, severe, uh, mentally ill people. And uh, if you have seen that uh, classic mu movie, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, that would have reminded uh, uh, you of what the North uh, Chicago ward uh, was like. So I come in, I, I have been assigned to Dr. James Morton, and uh, I come in uh, with the book I had been studying uh, for uh, psychopathology under my arm. And uh, he says to me, well, now, what are you going to do with that book? Um, and I said, well, I'm, I'm going to uh, diagnose the people here. And, uh, well, all right, uh, have a seat. Uh, I tell you what, I I'll bet you a cook that the next person crossing the threshold there uh, on the hallway is uh, diagnosis schizophrenic. And I'm, oh, wow, okay. Well, so uh, they are all alike. And I could see uh, Dr. James Morton kind of uh, rolling his eyes and uh, thinking, uh, oh, what do we have here? <laughs> Starting at a very, very low point this time. And uh, OK, so um, no, they are not all the same. In fact, he explained to me they are all different. Um, he was um, Adlerian in his thinking, and so that first day uh, I started uh, learning about uh, Adlerian ways of thinking about patients. He also had a, a, a consultant that uh, came to the hospital uh, once a week and saw a patient in front of a group of people, and uh, that consultant, uh, Jerry Shulman, was uh, a big uh, contributor in the Adlerian school in Chicago at that time. And so uh, what they were <coughs> showing um, when they saw patients uh, was they, they, they looked at early recollections, the first thing you remember, but they, they didn't want a still picture. Sometimes what we remember first is, is just a, a, a picture of yourself at age four or whatever uh, at some place. What they wanted was kind of a moving film. Uh, a, a moving recollection of something that was happening. And when they uh, evoked them f that uh, from the patient, then they uh, took a look at what the patient was recalling and um, made it into what they call lifestyle. Uh, their thinking was that uh, that early recollection sort of drove what that person uh, would be for the rest of his life, or at least for that moment. Um, through the year, I learned that, well, early recollections change from time to time. And it doesn't necessarily mean that your lifestyle that was uh, uh, first uh, 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 
recognize uh, was uh, your lifestyle forever sort of thing. Well, I, I had some problems. I, I was very attracted uh, to that way of thinking, but I had some problems with it. Uh, one problem I had was the day that uh, Jerry Shulman was asked, well, how do we learn this stuff? And he said, well, follow me for a year, and at the end of the year, you'll have a little sense of what this is all about. Well, uh, I wasn't in the position of following Jerry Shulman for a year. The other thing uh, was a concern of mine that if two Adlerians would see the same patient, uh, first they may get different early recollections, but secondly and more, most importantly, uh, from the early recollections, they would come up perhaps with different lifestyles. And, and so there was that uh, problem of uh, the uh, reliability of the lifestyle that they were uh, drawing from the patient. So I kept talking about these things. One of my classmates was uh, Gus Crivoglio, and at that point he was training at the Neuropsychiatric Institute in Chicago. And uh, we were good friends, and I kept talking to him about, well, you know, I'm, I'm really uh, very interested in this, but I kept telling him uh, the problems I had with it. And uh, one day he says, well, um, you should, uh, there's this guy at, at uh, the Neuropsychiatric Institute, you know, that um, wrote a book, and, and uh, you should take a look at that book, because I think that book is, is a little bit about what kinds of things you're interested in. And uh, I bought the book and uh, fell in love with it. Uh, this uh, uh, 1969 book by Ted Milan uh, was, uh, an eye-opener for me. It was a new paradigm. Uh, it had a, a finite number of personalities and, and personality entities in it. it. It wasn't this thing of a lifestyle and, uh, you know, it could be a zillion lifestyles. Uh, it, 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 Ted had a very good description of the entities so that you could read this book and even at uh, age 23 that I was at the time or whatever, I could understand what he was talking about and visualize the people that he was describing. It, uh, one thing that I have always liked was the range of severity. He, he could uh, see uh, these styles being your next door neighbor and functioning pretty well. And in fact, uh, he would argue that in some cases, people function well, not in spite of the lifestyle or the, the personality style, but because of their personality style. And so I like that kind of thing. And uh, finally, he had a theoretical framework to enhance our understanding about these lifestyles. Uh, and so once I uh, took a look at that book, and this is my rendition of what he was trying to say in that book, uh, once I uh, took a look at that, I was hooked. Uh, and in fact, that was a little bit of a problem between uh, Ted and I uh, through the years because he kept changing this thing. And uh, I didn't want him to change it. And this is perfect. Uh, how can you change perfection? And so uh, the, the other thing we, I, I completely failed on, uh, at one time or another, he tried to uh, show me how to uh, tie one of those uh, uh, bow ties of his, and uh, no, I, I, I don't think I will learn that uh, ever. But okay, uh, so uh, here was the, the uh, personality uh, scheme, and it was great, and so I, I was hooked. And, and so I, I tell God, so oh, this is wonderful. This is going to change my life. This is fantastic. And God says, well, give him a ring. Well, he gets me the telephone number, and um, I have the telephone number for days. I would look at it every, I mean, and this is a 23-year-old graduate student and, and calling the professor, and, and what am I going to say? Well, you know, I, I read your book, and, and, and I, I, I understand half of it, and, and uh, you know, it, it's good. <laughs> well, uh, so. One day, I don't know how, I developed enough courage to uh, pick up the phone and dial the number. It was a, a dial the number, literally, and uh, at the other end is, Ted Milan. 
Oh God, uh, maybe I should hang up and wrong number. I'm sorry, and hang up or something. But uh, no, okay. I told him I knew Gus Crivoglio and that uh, Gus had given me his name and that I had read his book and and uh, I, I was interested in his stuff. He listens to all of that and says, "Well, when when can you come over?" Well, all right. At that time, he was at the uh, Neuropsychiatric Institute of Chicago, which was part of the University of, Ch of Illinois in, in Chicago campus. These are pictures that I just stole from the web uh, 10 minutes ago. <clears throat> and uh, the day I go there, I'm introduced to Bob Meeker, who was his assistant. And uh, Bob, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, he died very young, but uh, the two of us uh, became very good friends, and uh, he was uh, uh, from then on my link with uh, with Ted, and uh, many of the things I got at the time that I'm going to share with you were things that I got through uh, Bob Meager uh, that uh, Ted was sending my way. So Ted uh, Milan eventually decides that. Uh, in order to measure the theory, he has to come up with some sort of instrument that will measure the theory so that we can all do studies with the theory. And uh, he started working on this questionnaire. Uh, one minute left, okay. Uh, the misery, we called it. Um, let's see, uh, this, my first copy of the misery was, uh, this is a dado machine. It's a machine that, uh, <laughs> we'll only give you 20 copies or something like that, so I felt pri very privileged to have, uh, if I can, uh, uh, this is my copy of the Misery, uh, printed with the Dido machine, and this is the uh, stencil that we used to, uh, and that we used to correct it. In here, you can see places where the letter has disappeared. That's actually in the stencil. There is a hole in there, okay? And, we, and then there were holes that were punched in the stencil, and you put the stencil on top of the answer sheet, and then you count the um, black marks uh, that you can see through the holes. And so that's the way the misery uh, was uh, uh, scored and um, I was all about, uh, let's see if I can get back to where I was before. And I, I'm gonna skip some of this because otherwise uh, he's gonna kick me out of the uh, stage here. Uh, uh, well, the, the misery uh, uh, eventually developed into, the, he, Ted Milan decided that he needed some pathology scales as well. And it developed into the uh, MCMI. And uh, throughout my career, I have had this great association with Ted and have written a uh, number of articles and uh, a book on the MCMI. And so that's uh, my. Uh... Thank you. Okay, let's see if I can uh, do I. Okay. Ted Milan was a man of grand stature. In all the ways a person's stature can be grand, intellectual, physical, emotional, and of course, personal logic. He had a big presence, a big voice, as we've all said, big hair, as we've all said. He used really big words, and he had a big sense of himself. He described himself as a secure narcissist, which, which he was, as it turns out. He would fill up a space, really. He'd fill up a room with his personality, his opinions, his brilliance, and his conviction. I first met Ted in 1982. I'd recently been hired at a company called National Computer Systems to bring Ted's first three tests, the MCMI, the MAPI, and a behavioral health inventory to market. Really let, to, let, let the world of clinical psychology know how Ted had taken his theory of personality development, his classification of personality disorders, and applied them to the world of personality assessment. Ted and I worked closely together for five years. During that time, he and I found and, and, and developed many, many common bonds 
bonds that over time really became as, as much personal as they were business related. In addition to our work, we talked about politics, our worldview, our shared Judaism, and our families. In 1987, I left NCS in the field of test publishing for almost 20 years. When I came back into the industry, first through American Guidance Service and then through Pearson, Ted and I reconnected quickly and strongly and naturally. In August of 2013, my work colleague and really good pal C.J. Thompson and I were visiting Port Jervis, New York. We spent two days in his and Renee's home talking about a range of things. The fourth edition of the MCMI, which is coming out later this year, how Ted's thinking and work had changed over the years, his view of personality assessment now and into the future. It was the end of the second day there that, of our meetings that Ted and I found each other uh, alone in his study. It had been a long day, full of information, full of reminiscences. He and I were both glad the day was over and glad to be alone together. I remember him giving me this particular look. He was in his wheelchair. I was no more than two feet away from him. Those of you who know Ted well, family, of course, and student and colleagues, will know what this look looked like. It was a look of insight, of things coming together, a look of certitude. And as we all know, Ted never lacked in his sense of certitude. So he looked at me with that look in his eyes and actually a little curly smile on his face and simply said, Theo, you know me well, and you know my stories. Maybe I should ask you to write my biography. To which I said, unthinkingly, unwaveringly, almost as an involuntary response, Ted, all you have to do is ask me. And there it was, out there. In 10 seconds, an offer and an acceptance a bond that was so personal, really, and so intimate that I don't think either one of us really understood it, at least at the time. I was kind of shocked at my response, how quick and unequivocal it was. I never make decisions quickly, much less on the spot. Wherever I've worked, whatever setting and whatever role I've had, including husband, as my wife can attest to, no one has ever accused me of acting too quickly. But there it was, and on we went. Ted and I had the chance to talk about this book. It's really a memoir, as it turns out, which is a story taken from someone's life as opposed to a biography, which is more of a story of someone's life. We talked a couple times before he passed away in late January of last year, and then after he died, his family asked me to continue the work. So now his stories have come from other people, some of whom are in this room. I've interviewed or otherwise heard from more than 40 people in building a foundation of my writing, and so today I want to share a couple things with you about what I feel like I've learned. Early on in my work, I came to think that there were many paradoxes in Ted's life, dynamics that initially seemed to be contradictory, seemed to be anomalous. But after I wrote these themes down, maybe theories is a better descriptor here, after I wrote these down on paper, thought about them, revisited them, I came to think that they were anything but contradictory. In fact, I came to believe that they were representative of how Ted thought about things, how he solved problems, and how he went about doing his work. Here's one example. Ted always worked. Family and colleagues alike reported this to me. He'd work during the day. He'd work into the evening. He'd work on his books. He'd work to stay in touch with former students and current colleagues. He'd work on his research. He'd work on his tests. Yet, and I should probably say and here instead of yet, he always made time for other people. His children or his grandchildren would come into the study and Ted would put down his pencil and ask how their day was going. He'd take a call or make a call to a former student to see how their research was going or to inquire about the person's next correct, uh, career move or maybe to offer his advice. He'd call someone at NCS or Pearson to see how their child was doing or ask another person how that person's health was coming along, or maybe just talk about the upcoming presidential election and make a prediction about that. He loved making predictions. Here's another apparent anomaly. Ted wasn't formally religious. Uh, in, in, in fact, in some manner, I think he fell away from Judaism at a pretty young age. Yet I do believe that much of his work and a good part of his worldview were both informed by and represented some of the strongest tenets some of the strongest traditions in Judaism. One such tradition is scholarship. Ted's personal history certainly reflects this. In, autobi in an autobiographical piece he wrote about 10 years ago, he traced his roots back to Eastern Europe into the early 1800s, 
where there was a long lineage of rabbis. Ted wrote, my grandfather was the youngest of nine sons of a Talmudic scholar and a yeshiva teacher. A yeshiva is a, a formal school with instruction based on Jewish teaching text, all of whose male children were educated and became rabbis. There are many things I'm sorry I never had a chance to talk to Ted about. Judaism was one of those things, but in listening to so many stories, from so many people describing Ted, I've come to believe that some of the most important parts of Judaism not only informed Ted's work, but resided deeply within him. At the heart of Judaism is intellectual curiosity, the pursuit of some larger truth, even when knowing that such a truth really doesn't exist, at least in any exact form. After all, Judaism is as much about, maybe even more about asking questions than it is giving answers. And Ted was a constant asker of questions, a constant seeker of truth. What do these data mean? How's all this information related? What else now needs to be done? And he also filled another important rabbinic role. People have mentioned this, that of a teacher. He loved teaching. Here's another quote from Ted's autobiographical piece. Teaching has always been a joy for me, occasions to improvise extemporaneously, to stir in audiences and empathetic sensibilities, if not to melt their minds, so to speak. I don't know what melt their minds was. It's probably some of the students probably know exactly of, of what he speaks. He was always examining things, and knowing this led me to another set of potentially contrasting dynamics, dynamics that I believe actually played themselves out in the development of some of his tests. There always has been, and I imagine always will be, discussions and debates around theory-based versus empirically-based. This is neither the time nor place, nor am I the person, I'm not even close to being the person to delve into these debates. But I can make some observations that I think might possibly shed some light on what drove Ted in his work. One caveat, Ted and I never talk directly about what I'm about to describe. It's fair to say what that I'm, about what I'm to say is interpretive, and I'm sure Ted would be just fine with that. I think Ted Milan's goal was nothing short of trying to understand, clarify, assess, and ultimately improve the human condition. Here's one story to represent the point. Shortly after Ted died, I went back to Ted and Renee's house. Renee and the entire family was gracious enough to open up his files and work to me, and I went to New York with a specific list of things that I hoped I would find. Some documentation of his work on the DSM-3, task force observations that he might have written down when working at the Allentown, Allentown, Pennsylvania State Hospital, notes related to his 1969 modern psychopathology book. I found quite a bit of that information, but I also found quite a surprise. On the afternoon of the second day there, I found something that I never even would have thought to look for, much less find. It was a large folded up document written in pencil in Ted's typical hard to decipher handwriting dated February 1962. It documented what I'm sure is some of Ted's very earliest work on the development of his theory of personality. Here's some topics that he had written down. Basic theoretical views, creation and evolution of physical matter, evolution of life, analysis of contemporary life, its character and dilemmas. And here's some notes he made along the way. The basic difference between living and non-living, hierarchy of organization via evolution, structure of nature, man's distinctions to handle random events and to symbolize the external world, the function of ideology and beliefs to simplify ambiguity and complexity, to smoothen social and personal dissonances. This is how Ted saw the world. It was a world for him of philosophy and science, of cosmology and classification, of music, mostly classical and of art, of societal norms and of mental illness, of randomness and of order. No wonder then that his work was so large in scope to provide first a theory, then classification schema, and then measures by which to assess, diagnose, and ultimately treat patients who struggle to make sense of the world who struggle to find a way to fit into the ways of that world, struggle to determine what it means to be alive. So what is it Ted Milan will leave behind? What is it that he's given us, all of us, and will stay as a result of his seeking to better understand the human condition? Here's a list worth thinking about, worth remembering. He wrote, as some people have said already, what many consider to be a seminal work in personality disorders. It's a 1969 modern psychopathology book. 
He was one of the first two psychologists to serve on any DSM task force. He was instrumental in providing psychology and practicing psychologists a seat at the DSM table. He helped move mental illness away from being defined, described, defined and described purely through a medical model. He authored many, many books and helped educate many, many students. He mentored and worked closely with his students, many of whom had come to, have actually come to be recognized as experts in their own right. And he has, of course, authored a set of personality assessments that have delivered a kind of clinical utility that has improved the practice of clinical psychologists and improved the, really improved the lives of countless other people. One of the people I interviewed for the book, someone in the profession, but not a former student, not a co-author, not a business associate, not a family member. I'd like to say who it was. It sounds like I'm being secretive. It's not. I haven't asked this man if it was OK to give this quote. So I'll just give you the quote. Here's what he said when I asked him how he thought Ted would be remembered. A lasting imprint of Ted, he said, will be the millions of Americans who will be better understood because of his tests. Quite a legacy to leave behind. So I want to end on a personal note in this very public setting. In asking Ted, in, in asking me to write his memoir and trusting me with the stories of his life, Ted has given me this remarkable gift. This is not a gift born of intellect, although that intellect was prodigious. It's not a gift born from his work, although that work was inspired. Rather, it's a gift that came from the place in his own human condition that wound up connecting the two of us. Not in the ways of science and scholarship, not in the ways of business and commerce, but in the ways all of our strongest bonds are crafted and sustained. He gave me this gift of and from his heart, and for that I will be forever grateful.
Anybody, 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 anybody